You're approaching Belfast from the Irish Sea. And as Ulster people say when they're thanked, you're welcome. You're now in Belfast Loch, a waterway so deep that the greatest warships can ride in it. That square-looking fortress on the South Antrim coast is Carrickfergus Castle. From this point, the loch narrows swiftly to Belfast, and the first signs of the city you see are the shipyards on the Queen's Island. You're looking now at the largest single shipyard in the world. From underneath those great gantries hanging in the sky, some of the largest liners in the world have slipped into the lagoon and the loch. We're berthing now in Belfast, capital city of Northern Ireland, nearly half a million inhabitants. It stands at the mouth of the River Lagan on land that once was worthless bog. And it is now the largest industrial city in Ireland and the sixth of the great ports of the United Kingdom. But Ulster is not only an industrial area. In a range of country no larger than Yorkshire, it has a wonderful variety of scenery where every kind of sport and pastime can be found. At the centuries old Lammas Fair, the farmers and their families come to market. There are seven glens in Amsham. Away to the south, in County Down, the beautiful Mourne Mountains sweep down to the sea. Out of those high, dark hills is dug the granite for the pavements and palaces of the great cities across the sea. You can see it slung into cargo ships at the little villages round the coast. If you were to rise early enough, you would see the herring boats bringing in their catches to these same small harbours. They've spent several days at sea over the fishing beds which lie between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Ulster is a country of small farms, seldom of more than 50 acres each. These quiet fields were typical of the serenity of Ulster until September 1939, when war was declared on Germany. Without hesitation, the people of Ulster declared their loyalty to the cause of the United Kingdom and of European freedom. The mills and factories, the shipyards and the engineering shops in Belfast and Derry and throughout the six counties were ready for action. The island men on Queen's Island went to it with redoubled energy and strength. All the resources and experience of this host of highly skilled workers was swiftly enlisted in the service of Britain. And day and night, the labor of building ships for the merchant fleet went on. And not only merchant ships, ships for the Royal Navy too. 
To the expanding aircraft industry came many of the skilled workers from the shipyards. Almost in a single evening, Ulster's industries were converted from the manufacture of peacetime tools to the manufacture of weapons of war. Workshops which had made spinning and weaving machinery for years now began to make shells for anti-aircraft guns. In this factory, where suits for civilians were formerly made, they are now sewing uniforms for troops. Look at this rope works, the largest in the world. Cotton and manila and raw hemp are here spun into twines and ropes of every size and for every use. For tents, for tarpaulins, the balloon barrage, the use at the dockyards, for hauling guns. This enormous rope is used to lift the barrels of giant guns in the factories. These girls in this rope works are knitting nets for minesweepers and for camouflage, as well as for the fishing, even more essential in war than in peace. The factories and machine shops of Ulster are a vital part of Britain's war effort. They produce goods not only for the fighting forces, but also, and just as importantly, for foreign sale. The export trade of Northern Ireland is enormous over 70 million pounds worth in a year. And it is essential to the United Kingdom today more than ever before, because it enables us to buy vital goods and materials abroad. Belfast is the most important manufacturing center of the linen trade in the whole world. Its linen is the second largest single export from the United Kingdom to the United States. Today, the looms of Ulster are weaving wings for aeroplanes and tents for soldiers, as well as fashioning finer fabrics for foreign sale. From Ulster's fields is pulled much of the flax which is spun and woven in the country. From its small farms comes much of the whole nation's food. They send to Great Britain every year three and a half million hundredweights of potatoes, over 200,000 store and fat cattle, more than 168,000 lambs and sheep, nearly four and a half million pounds worth every year of hams and sides of bacon, and 610,000 hundredweights of eggs. The Northern Irish farmers were asked by the government to plough up an extra quarter of a million acres. They promptly did this and an extra 25,000 acres as well. Those are a few of Ulster's contributions to our war effort. The products of her industry, the produce of her soil, and finally, her fighting sons. She has enlisted her men in famous Ulster regiments. Here are the Royal Ulster Rifles on the march. But she has not only sent her men into her own regiments, she has sent others into all the defense and fighting forces, into the Navy, which guards our shores and keeps the sea routes free for our merchant fleet. Men for the Royal Air Force, soon destined to become, as the King has said, the wonder of the world. Ulster's voluntary organizations are working full-time too, providing comforts for the men and the forces. And Ulster's daughters too. They're in every women's force, abroad and at home. The Northern Ireland Parliament 
made this declaration at the outbreak of war. The people of Loyal Ulster will share the burdens of their kith and kin in every part of the empire to the uttermost extent of their resources. Britain's difficulty is Northern Ireland's opportunity to place all her possessions, human and material, at the service of our King. The people of Ulster have long loved and defended liberty. They will not fail to defend it now. <laughs>